morning. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. Today's going to be a good one. I'll be whipping up two delicious dishes for top country duo. Ward Thomas will be here Yay! as they swing by the house a little bit later, and we're joined in the house by the first ever British woman to win a Michelin star with the legendary Francis Aitkins. Fires up the hobs a little bit later. She's coming on the show a second time to the house, and I'll be sharing one of my favourite ever vegetable recipes when we join this year's Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign. And we'll be getting some more top tips on growing your own fruit and veg from top gardener Dom Van Marsh will be here as well. First time at the house, looking forward to that one. But don't miss this week's Little Masterclass. We'll be serving a stunning dish made with cod and cauliflower. Both dishes banging season at the moment. And I'll say the best till last because I'm here with a chef who always serves up first-class cuisine uh, uh, with an element of chaos on the side. It's Mr. Not, Paul Rankin. Love a bit of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Top of the morning, Tim. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, what are you going to be doing then? For, what are you going to be cooking for? Something classic, are you? Well, I'm, variant of a classic. Well, we're coming up to St. Patrick's Day, so I'm going to cook a version of an Irish stew. It's kind of like a lamb shank Irish stew. OK. And it's a recipe that was developed by my first ever sous chef, Eugene Callaghan, and I've nicked it from Eugene. <laughs> Huge, if you're watching. <laughs> so, still... so, Irish stew, would that be made out of the chops or you making it out of the middle neck or traditionally? What would it be? Well, traditionally, it's just made out of, out, out of, like, like, shoulder chops and yeah. bits of scrag and yeah. neck and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And Traditionally, Irish stew is just lamb, or lamb, more likely mutton, yeah. potatoes, onions, and water. That's, That's it. it. That's it. And Albert Roux used to love a plain Irish stew. Yeah. You know, he loved that simple sort of lip-smacking, tasty, one-pot kind of dish. Well, talk about simple sort of things. What we're going to do now is, as I thought, for this one, we're kicking things off. Because it's a Saturday morning, there's going to be a certain element of people that are still in bed watching this, maybe a bit hungover. There's going to be a certain <laughs> element of people at the gym just about to step on the treadmill. Yeah. This is going to sort both of those groups out because this is the ultimate bacon sandwich. And when I say the ultimate, we take bacon sandwiches to a different level. So in we go with the butter, and then oh. in we go with the bacon. You're not messing about here, fella. So, so, <laughs> so, we got, we oh. got, so I want you to take all this bacon. Is now, it, are we making like a bacon cake? No, this what? is for one. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. <laughs> so, I want it nice and crispy, crispy. And then just as it starts to crisp up, we're going to put a little bit of maple syrup with it, all right? OK. So okay. I'm going to leave you to cook that. Meanwhile, I've got in here uh, some pork over here. We're going to introduce this amazing supplier, Tom, in a second, but I've got some pork over here because I want to get this on. What I've done with the pork belly with this is I've basically just... same. It was the half of this, and all I've done is put it in a pan with some aromats and poached it. So in there, I've got some onions, some bay leaf, a little bit of star anise. Is it bacon or is it just fresh pork? This is bacon. Bacon, nice. And then yeah. what I've done is I've basically just poached it like this, and you can see the size of it, how it thickens up once it's poached. This takes about sort of 40 minutes. Leave it in the liquor, and I'm going to slice it. I'm going to barbecue this. OK. And serve this with a little ni nice little maple syrup yep. glaze. Cool. And the, 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 so the barbecue sauce is really simple. For barbecue sauce, you don't need to buy it. We've got brown sugar, we've got ketchup, and soy. And that is barbecue sauce. Done. All right. And Brown sugar, ketchup, and soy. Well, that's barbecue sauce. Yeah. And if you want to do maple or syrup, honey, you could use soup. you can use honey, oh. or you can use maple syrup. Which yeah. I'm going to put some maple syrup in there. So maple syrup, and then what you do is you just put that on the side. Okay. Now look at this bacon. You just leave it cooking away it nicely. It smells great. Oh, this is going to be. It smells ace. great. There's a little bit of smoke on this. This is going to be ace. Ah. nice and crispy. That's going to go in a bowl and everything else. And I'm basically going to take this pork and then slice it, and we're going to barbecue it. Now, this when we started this off about. Well, it must be three years now. We started off introducing everybody at home with all these amazing suppliers. And you never stop learning this game, as you all know. Yeah, yeah. But you never stop introducing to new suppliers and new people who produce this amazing food that we have in this country as well. None more so than the gentleman we're about to meet now. So we're about to head down to Cornwall to speak to Tom Adams from Coombs Head Farm. Tom, you're, you're stood there on your farm as well. Welcome to the show. Good morning. How are you? Now, I know you're looking at this. I know you were looking on the camera going, that looks that looks pretty good. But it's your products anyway. So so tell me how all this lot started then, because you come from a sort of restaurant -y background. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Yeah, so I was... Um, I think, like, like many, I was working... Um, I spent a lot of time in London. Um, when I finished school, I, I wanted to start um, cooking. Uh, I was pretty lucky my family... Um, all cook a lot. My family farm in 
in Hampshire, so I was pretty lucky to kind of grow up with food. And, um, yeah, just cooked in, cooked in London in restaurants for um, about um, 10, 11 years. And then, um, yeah, kind of felt the need to, to get out of um, London. Um, and I was at the time sort of dabbling in, 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 in producing and rearing pigs in Hampshire, where my family are. And then, um, but yeah, Cornwall always just sort of appealed. So why, why Cornwall um, then, to produce a farm? Were, were, were you looking at all around the UK, or why, why did you settle for Cornwall? Not that it's a bad place to settle. Um, no, it's, it's, it's nice. It's like, it, there's a nice, like, wildness to it. But um, I think mainly because I met, when I first started in London, I met a butcher's... Um, from a from a town in Cornwall called Launceston, uh, a butcher's called Philip Philip Warren, and um, so I just began to spend as much time as I could with them, trying to learn butchery and and a bit more about the husbandry and and so forth. And that, <clears throat> yeah, and that just started me. Well, uh, you yeah, can looking tell, you can looking tell, in and around Cornwall. You can tell from the meat that we got in here. Now people will be looking at this, going, look at look at the. F I mean, I'm uh, we used to be pig farmers. Look at this. Look at the. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. So tell us what we got. Is this is this the mangalista pig? Is this because we got the chops here? We got the bacon. What what is this yeah. that we're looking at here? Well, you've actually. So that belly is actually from a middle white um, yeah. pig. Uh, we 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 have two breeds on the farm. We have we have middle whites and mangalitsas, and the mangalitsas we we predominantly keep for. Um, like for charcuterie and curing, they they're they're a lard pig, so they produce obscene amounts of of fat. And then the middle white is a more traditional, like rare breed British porker, and um, I guess produces joints that you would um, <clears throat> associate with good, like good free range rare breed British pork. Yeah. Um, they take about like nine to ten months to mature. Uh, they're not the biggest pig, um, but. Yeah, for us, they, they make really neat little, like, joints to have have at home, whereas the mangalits are, yeah, could probably be a bit intimidating if you were to, like, try and handle all that fat at home. But the middle <laughs> white's kind of a nice middle ground. And it's not just not just pork that you're doing as well. So you're venturing other things. We've got a selection of bits and pieces that you sell. And, and it started out, your farm started out, like, not as a farm, but as a B&B, &B, didn't it, as well? That's what you That's what you were doing fundamentally first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, for the first year, we were just doing... Um, we just had five rooms in the farmhouse and we would cook cook dinner each night. Um, and it was, yeah, it's always been a pretty simple affair. And then we opened a small little restaurant in the courtyard and a bakery. And then we kind of always developed it pretty organically. We just sort of... If we could take on a bit more, we did. But... And what then about, when what COVID... about, you've got the farm, what about the vegetables that we've got in here? You've got different types of pickles that you're doing as well. Tell us about these ones that you've got in here. Yeah. This is the chef -y, this is the chef so... side of you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess during, um, yeah, during COVID, we, we had um, no restaurant and no sort of no rooms to deal with. So we, we kind of um, just spent the whole time... Um, expanding production on the farm and in the garden so what you've got there is basically now we we do a little bit of retail and we just view it as whatever's excess so when we have big gluts um and more than the restaurant can handle um yeah we just go into production mode yeah well hopefully you're seeing this because just just look at this combination of Michelin star chef and myself but look look at look at this just to finish it look at that glaze how good does that look i want a big Mouthful of <laughs> well, that's soon the, coming soon. That, that's yeah. not the bacon sandwich, but we've got in here. Uh, mega. We got the, in here as well the nice little bit of slaw that sits with it, and that's your apple, your celeriac, a little bit of mayonnaise together with a little bit of grey mustard. That's nice. that one done. But now, now, now we need sorry, sorry to take the camera away from you, Tom, because now we need to pay attention on this. We cooked the bacon in here. This is the bacon that's been cooked in this butter and a little bit of oil. You've got the bacon fat in there. The bacon is sat in here, it's crisped up, and I put maple syrup over the top. That's this. We then take some tomatoes. Now, tomatoes... Oven roast tomatoes. Oven roast tomatoes, yeah. to, just to strengthen the flavour, and then we take these and you pop them in the pan. But then, most importantly, to finish off our sandwich, before we do anything, we then take the char-grilled bread and we fry the bread in the pan. 
So we're going to fry this all off. So what's next for you, Tom? What, what, where do you want to be? Are, are you happy with where you are? What, what's, what's next for you? Um, well, I don't know. I think after the last three years, it'd be quite nice to just have a, a pretty simple year, to be honest. But I think we're just good. We're happy to keep, like, keep, keep like, farming. Um, do you need any help? a little bit more than we... Do you need Pardon? any help in the restaurant? Oh, oh too much help. We, yeah, we need all the, we need all the help. Because um, I quite fancy uh, pretty relentless. a country life down in Cornwall. Yeah, exactly. Well, Tom, I wish you all the very best to look with it. We're going to finish off with this sandwich, look. And keep up the good work. You then, yeah, Thank exactly. You very much. A produce champion you are, mate. <laughs> You're a produce champion. <laughs> yeah. They got this. This bacon looks amazing. But look, you take this, this bit now, and we take more of our. <laughs> oh, it's a triple decker. Oh, oh my! <laughs> Moly. I, I'm Moly. getting weak just looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone absolutely <laughs> mad. <laughs> <laughs> look, oh, look this. this is. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I've got pains in my chest. <laughs> Go to the gym. Look, you take your bacon sandwich like that. No, no, but what are you More, doing? Yeah. What do you take this? Look, fried bread. You warm it up. You put on that, that on there. And there we have it. There we have it. Tom, hopefully I've done that justice. Oh my the God! You absolute beast. <laughs> Hopefully I've done that justice. I wish you all the very best with it. Thank you so much for bringing Thank all this as well much. and sending me it as well. We love producers like you because you guys make us look good when yeah. we put it on the table. So <laughs> much love, Thank much you love. Much. There you go, Tom. Take care. So there you have it. They have a pan fried or barbecued with a maple glaze pork belly with a little slaw. But this, this is this is it be ultimate bacon sandwiches. Now, you've been told in the lesson in life is you never eat anything bigger than your head. Today's going to be an exception. I dare you to take a bite of that. I will, but we've just got to do a pretty shot yet. Yeah? Take this. Right, which bit do you want? This one or this one? I want to try and take a bite of that. Get in there, get in there. Huh? Right? I'm going to get locked, John. I'll be like, ah, ah, <laughs> OK. <laughs> that must be, like, the world's biggest and most calorific bacon sandwich ever. No, it's not. I'm not sure... only is there fat in it, but there's sugar in it as well. <laughs> oh, my... <laughs> Help! <laughs> well, it's good, though. Oh, my goodness. The fat is just dripping. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. mm. <laughs> See you later. Bye. <laughs> oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Come. <laughs> Happy? Mm. Huh? That's epic, man. I told you, epic. Right, right. still to go. <laughs> Paul laid on a lamb shank Irish stew. Uh, and country duo Ward Thomas will be with us uh, throughout the morning, but don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're following that meat feast up with a portion of vegetables as we get involved in this year's Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign. Go for it. <laughs> Again. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now, I'll be whipping up a dish of cod and cauliflower in this week's Little Mass class. And country duo War Thomas will be making a welcome return to the house very shortly. But first, every year we get involved in ITV's Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign that aims to make food fun and get more kids eating more veg and fruit at home and at school. It's a brilliant scheme that many of you have seen promoted all over ITV with ads like this. They come from deep underground. Their plan? To take over the world. For years, the grown-ups have been keeping the veg invasion at bay. But they can't do it alone. They need your help, kids. You're going down, peace. <gasps> I'm helping to defeat them. Join the fight. Eat them to defeat them. How cool is that? 
Right, it's time for more cooking now. As the Eat Them to Defeat Them campaign, it's all about veg over the next few weeks, so we're going to be dipping into the archives and sharing recipes for some brilliant vegetable dishes for you to try at home. And we're starting off this week at the end of the garden, just the other side of this hedge, where I'm going to make the most of some of the homegrown tomatoes that I've grown. Enjoy this one. This is a lovely little dish and it utilises all what's great about what's in the garden. We've got some beautiful courgettes here. You get courgettes in all different shapes or sizes, these ones as well as a classic sort of shape. And I'm going to basically stuff some of these wonderful tomatoes with some lamb mince, a little bit of rice, a little bit of cinnamon, just to give it a nice little spice, and some mint, and, and basically pop it in the oven, really. So it starts off by preparing the tomatoes. So you will need big sort of tomatoes for this one. A lot of people use beefsteak tomatoes, but you get these beautiful heritage ones. Look out for different ones, because these taste particularly good, way better than the beefsteak ones, I find. So we're just going to take a knife and just trim the top off like that. Just, I always try and do it at an angle, really, rather than flat. You'll see the reason why in a minute, all the filling just flies out if you're not careful. So just trim that off like that. And then I find the easiest way, you can use a spoon, but I do find the easiest way is to use a melon baller or a little Parisian scoop. And you basically just scoop out the insides. You get different size ones of these, but I do find it easier, particularly if you buy one like this one that's got a large one this end and a small one this end. It just enables you to scoop it out a lot easier than using a spoon. But it's this filling that we want because obviously that goes back in with the addition and a few more bits and pieces, particularly the courgettes, a little bit of aubergine, and of course the lamb. You can bulk it out with a lot of rice. I'm only going to put a little bit in, but you can bulk it out with some cooked rice as well. So just hollow that lot out as much as you possibly can. I wouldn't go too close because you don't want to split the tomatoes, of course. And then make sure the lids go with each tomato, otherwise it's literally cat and mouse trying to put them all back together again. So for the filling itself, we're just going to take some onion and just half an onion will probably be enough for this. And the idea being you want it all sort of finely diced or as fine as you can get it because the bigger the pieces, the less filling or variety of filling you have in your tomato. So when you're doing this, take your time and chop the onion nice and fine. So the same with the garlic. Just a couple of cloves of garlic is what you want for this. I'm going to roast up about sort of six tomatoes, something like that. But you do want a little bit of garlic in here, because obviously that's great with tomatoes, some garlic. And then do the same thing with the veg. But you don't want too much veg, because remember, you've got that tomato pulp going in, you've got some lamb, everything else. But again, the most important thing is, is keep the size the same. So take your time in terms of preparing this. So when you get the courgettes, nice and finely diced. And then we do the same thing with a little bit of aubergine. So just a touch of aubergine. Like that. Same again. Now, you will end up with more filling that you need, but you can utilise that anyway. You can make a little lasagna out of it, that kind of stuff. So nothing really goes to waste. You can also just roast it off in a dish topped with cheese, any bits that you've got left over. So dice it all up nice and fine. And then I've got a hot pan on the stove, and then what we want to do is just fry off the filling. And we're going to start with the veg, first of all. Now, I'm adding a little bit of lamb mince to this. You can use a variety of different mince whatever you want, chicken, you can do this with prawns, you can just do it with veg if you want, but I've just got a little bit of lamb mince here that I'm just going to add to the mix. That should be enough. I like to add about half mince to veg, really. So fry that off a little bit. And then, of course, we've got all this amazing pulp. We don't want to waste any of this. This is this beautiful tomato pulp from the inside of the tomatoes, so basically all that goes in. Now, it depends on how dry the mixture is at this point. It depends on how seasonal, really, your tomatoes are. So if it is a little bit dry, you can add a little bit of stock, which I've got in here. If not, I think that'll be all right. We just sweat that down. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see, after about sort of eight to 10 minutes, what you end up with is this lovely soft mixture. Now, if it starts to dry out too much, you've got a little bit of stock. That will happen when you start adding the rice, but you can add a touch of spice to this, a little bit of cinnamon, not too much, some salt, of course, and some black pepper. And then the only herb that I'm gonna put in here is just a touch of mint, really. You don't have to put anything in, really. Mint, basil would work, a bit of fresh thyme. I've got some growing down there as well but you can mix and match whatever you want to put in, but just a little bit of mint. And I've got some cooked rice here. Now, it's really up to you how much you put in. You can bulk this out as much as you want, but I'm just gonna put just a little bit in here. Now, you do have to be careful when you add the rice, it will start to soak up. You can see the liquid in there. If I stir this together, it actually starts to soak it up even more. Now, we don't want it too wet, otherwise when we roast off the tomatoes, they're just gonna basically just end up with a load of mush, but certainly not, we don't want it too dry. But that kind of looks good. And the good idea is, is having cooked rice, as it absorbs that mixture, you can tell straight away if it starts to warm up whether you need to add a little bit more. So just warm it up slightly, like that, and then we can get ready on our tomatoes. Now, we'll just make sure they're in the right order, the lids. Like that, like that. And then when we're happy with the mixture, which looks pretty good, we can then pop it in the tomatoes. Pop it in there. And you want to compact it as well. So make sure it's nice and full. It is one of these things that, it's a bit like the chicken Kiev, I think, stuffed tomatoes. It, it, I used to have this a lot. I used to cook it a lot when I was a young kid, working in kitchens. Um, but you only really find it nowadays in classic, classic restaurants. And it's usually not served as a, as a dish in its own right, usually as a sort of side order, which is a shame, because when you get really good tomatoes like this, particularly ones from a greenhouse, your homegrown stuff, it tastes amazing, it really does. But pop them in. Like that. You can see you've got plenty in there. And then what I'm going to do now is just take some of this. This is boccaccini, which is like a, a small mozzarella, small buffalo mozzarella. And all I'm going to do is just break that, and place it on the top. And I want to allow this sort of cheese to melt as it cooks. We just press that down like that. So it just sits on there. And then you can grab your lid each lid on the top. Now, I'm going to cook these straight from this, but you can actually, if you wanted to, pop these in the fridge and then cook them from cold. Just with a bit of olive oil. It'll take about sort of 20, 30 minutes in an oven, 200 degrees, something like that. In an oven, in your kitchen, again, about when the mixture's still hot, probably about eight to 10 minutes. In this, should be about six. Now, to serve these, you can serve them with whatever you want, a little bit of pesto if you want, but they can also be used as a nice little garnish with grilled meats if you wanted, but I actually just like serving them as they are like that. Look at these. Look amazing. You can get yourself a plate and just lift one of them on there. And all it really needs, I think, is just really good quality olive oil. Just poured over the top. And there you have it. Stuffed tomatoes with lamb and a little bit of spice. It's lovely, isn't it?
They're tasty dishes there. Now, I hope that's inspired you to get cooking. And don't forget, you can find loads more recipe ideas on the Eat Them to Defeat Them website. Still to come, we'll be finding out how to start growing your own fruit and veg with Dom Van Marsh, that amazing veg grower. I'll see you here after the break. We'll be cooking for my guest, Ward Thomas. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Now, coming up, Chef Francis Atkin will be treating us to a wild herb and cabbage cake. But first, I'm excited about this one. I'm here with some homegrown Hampshire talent who have conquered the world of country music and been called Britain's answer to Dolly Parton. It's Lizzie and Catherine, aka Ward Thomas. <laughs> Welcome back, welcome back, welcome ah, back. Thanks for having us. Great, you're always smiling, you girls. Oh, well, there's it's a lovely glass well, of wine in front of us. Basically, <laughs> half, say, half a I bottle of wine is gone as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, so we're going to... Uh, I know you love your food as well. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to make you a, a little curry. I'm going to make you a, a, a king prawn curry. We're going to start off with some onions in the pan, which are browned off. I call these sort of... Whenever I'm doing this, I call these fairground onions. Do you know the ones? Yes. Fairground yeah. onions. So we're going to make this... So we're going to cook these, and I've got some bay leaf, I've got some curry leaves. This is fresh curry leaves. Ooh. We've got some little bit of ginger, a little bit of garlic, and then I'm going to add... This is a sort of tomato-based sauce, really, I suppose. That's going to go in there. And then the chilli side of it... Depends how hot you like it, but I'm just oh. going to take a bit of chilli. Oh, that in. wow. Well, you can take it out afterwards. A little bit of bay leaf, <laughs> bay leaf in there as well. And then in we go one. with some tomatoes and it all starts to come together. So, first of all, congratulations on, on what a career so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, mean, you. I love this. It's stereo sound. It's great. Yeah, is that, but how did, where did the love affair of music start? Was that, was that with the family? Was that at home listening to music? Where does that, where does that come from? Yeah, very yeah. much at home. Um, we were in the choir at school, so we learned to harmonise from a very young age. Yeah, we were surrounded by music, literally from the work. I, we were doing a... We sang Happy Birthday at one of our um, family's weddings when we were three, so I think... When <laughs> you were so, three? Wrong, yeah, we were three. Like... wrong song and wrong, you know, occasion, but... I think, so, we, so, yeah, I think we started wanting to sing from the so very how, age, how, together. How come country music? How, how did you pick that? Because you could have picked anything with the voices like you, you guys have got. So how, wh why country music, then? Because it's a particular genre of music that... Yeah. It's not that popular in the UK. It's growing, thanks to you guys. But oh. how, how, why, why country music, then? Well, we grew up in a very rural setting, you know, around lots of animals, and I think it was in our blood from when we were growing up. And then we heard a lot of country music from Nashville, and so I think we just found a love for it and the harmonies and the stories from a really young age. And, uh, and we started writing our own music from quite a young age, yeah. from around 14, when we were 14 14, years old. you were yeah. writing your own stuff? They were terrible. It wasn't very good, yeah. It was, yeah. It was awful. <laughs> right. But it all just sounded very country, authentically. Um, right. And then our harmonies just suited that kind of style of... Genre. So do you both play instruments as well? That's where you come from? Or? Yeah, not very well, again. I mean, <laughs> you you're, just, you're not bad at enough. guitar, though. Just you? enough to be able to sing she with it. She always says this. <laughs> um, just enough, yeah. I mean, our vo voices are our main instrument, but yeah. it was a natural progression to learn to play guitar and piano for writing as well. Yeah. You say that. We both share our love affair of guitars. Yeah. The last time you were on, you just, you're just about to go on tour yes. and you, you broke your guitar. Uh, oh. Yeah, really bad. And I was like... This is terrible timing, and it was really scary because I love that guitar so much, and your lovely man fixed it for me. So. You're on tour as well at the moment as well. Then touring yes, must yeah. be amazing for you as well, isn't it? Oh, we well, we love touring, and it's. I, I think we were talking about this earlier, but um, when you're singing live, it's it's when you realise that you're why you're doing this because you get to play your music, and people just turning up to your own shows is such a reward, so... It's proof. It's proof, It's yeah. like we put music out there and you don't really know if anyone's listening or if anyone likes it, and then when well, you've had a it number back... one album, and <laughs> well, the, the only British number one act to have a number one album. <laughs> I mean, I know, but I think that the fear of, like, people still not liking it or not turning up to the <laughs> show just never goes away. You still feel like that? Yeah, it never goes away. I stand side of stage before every gig and think, is there anyone out there? Has anyone turned up? <laughs> And then we did um, one of those live streams in lockdown where literally no one actually turned up. And that was just very That horrible. was weird. Yeah. yeah, everyone was watching it I from home. It, it came to life. And um, I wish the cameraman would, like, would clap after the songs or something. They don't do that with this show anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> and we did. It was like a full-on gig. I mean, it was really fun to do, very different, but it was 
very weird to not have an audience there after each song. Yeah. So look, yeah. we're just going to do. A, well, this is our little dal now. So, so we've got the tomato, and I'm cooking that down, and then we add some cream to this. Oh. And we're going to cook this down now, and then we're going to add some butter to this. And this is our nice little sauce. We're going to put the shrimps in there and cook that. The shrimps I've got on here, at which I've just opened them up, just take some oil like that, a bit of the old salt over the top, and some black pepper. And I'm going to pop them into the grill. They're going to take about sort of two to three minutes to cook. That's all that's I'm going to say. Can, Do we yeah. need to watch the clock? You can watch the clock. Watch. Or... <laughs> It's not my first rodeo. I've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we've got on here. This is our lentil dal. So you can take a mixture of different spices. So we've got uh, garam masala, I've got some turmeric, and I've got some, some mustard seeds, which you can toast off as well. So they're going to go in there. And you want to toast these off with the onions. The spices, you've got to be careful with this. So if you put the spices in, dry spices in, uh, in a dry pan, people say you toast them, but you can actually burn these quite badly. So if you, if you want to try this for the yeah. first time, Mix these with water and then okay, put them in there. Because I've I have think I think I have burnt that in the past. Yeah, so well, when when have you I, ever toasted the gam spices? <laughs> oh, you, you, I'm into it at the moment. I'm into cooking at the moment. I'm going through a phase. I think toasting spices is like the next level of like well, you don't live together now, do you? Yeah, no, That's we true. don't. <laughs> she has no she, no, she idea. actually cooks away yeah. from you. It's not. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know. Well, when we lived together, she, I always, she loved cooking. So I was like, why do I need to cook? And so now I have to cook for myself. I think I'm just like <laughs> minimum effort, and like toasting spices yeah. is like when you're doing it properly. <laughs> so I'm very impressed because. Yeah. <laughs> so then you get some water, and we're just going to pour that in like that. And we cook this sort of this simple little dal. You just keep cooking it and cooking it. You can add a little bit of bay leaf, like I said. You can pop that in there. And we're going to cook that down, cook that down. It takes about sort of 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and we end up with what we've got in here. Ooh. This is this sort of dal. And then I'm going to finish that off with some fresh lemon, some butter and some herbs and that kind of stuff. And then in our nice little bit of curry that we've got in here, as we start to mix this all up, then we can start adding our butter and our shrimp and everything in there. So tell us about the, the new album, the new tour, and g give everybody a little insight into to the, to, to what they can expect. Um, so the tour starts on the 30th of March, so we're not quite there yet, but we're getting ready for it. Um, the new album's very much an organic country record, country Americana record. Um, it's called Music in the Madness, yeah. which feels very apt for the last few years that we've gone through, and we've yeah. done what we can and like make sense of it by writing songs about it. Was that good for you that that lockdown in terms no, of well, in terms of writing and stuff like that? Because I, I mean, in some cases it was yeah. good because it was it was good for us to just sort of actually stay home and really like take a deep breath. But at, but at the same time, it was really not fun to not be able to like go out on the road and tour and recording remotely and writing remotely is just not. Not really, not the I same. Mm. But so yeah. I, I remember speaking to you about your, you know, the albums that you've done in the past. You did part of it in, in Nashville, part of it in the UK. Is that the same with this one? Yes, yeah. exactly the yeah. same. We you did lucky some. things, eh? We are so, lucky. We get, we're so lucky. Yeah, we love Nashville, so it's good. We like to create and write there, and then um, come and come and record so it. Over. What, record what is it, it about here. Nashville then? I mean, anybody that hasn't, uh, that's been there will know what I'm talking about. But but those people who have never been, what what is it about Nashville in terms of music? I mean, you are literally, every day you wake up and you are just surrounded by music. And so going over there as songwriters and creatives, it's just a dream because you get to create with so many other people just like you. Um, that's what I love about Well, it, it certainly doing. worked because we're going to show a little clip now of, of the... Uh, one of the tracks, you can you can tell us about it once we see this, but anyway, play this. There's the shrimp. Oh, delicious. About this, and we get so many artists on this show. You're, you're exactly like 90% of them. I'm not watching it. I'm not oh, watching it. I'm not watching it. I'm not watching it. It's you so feel... hard watching yourself. Oh, yeah. It, it's, you, you pick out 
parts of yourself when it's you the watch the Yeah, it's the same as how people don't like the sound of their own voice or, like... It's just... I've been television for 30 years, never watched the programme that I've ever made. Oh, no. I'll go out of a room. <laughs> I'll just leave, leave the room. Yeah. I'll leave the room. But your, your, but your, your music, the, the harmonisation, I mean, you must get that from... That benefits for you've been sisters. Yeah, de yeah, definitely. I think also we've been singing together since we were very young. And uh, it's like, I think it's a sister thing, but also... A time thing. So, like, I'm just going to recap what we've got in there because we've already served this now. So we've oh, got wow. the shrimp. That's the shrimp curry. Oh, that looks so good. We've been spoiled. A bit of salt. <clears throat> the key to that, and I think the dal is, is proper seasoning. So season it with salt. And then to simply serve this, we've got two nice... Beautiful plates. Balls. Yeah, these, these are made by a potter in, in Manchester. I'd like to thank him because um, oh. he uh, supplies my restaurant with these, these little pots, and they're all different. I think they're, they're cool, but... And then we've got our little lentil dal, which is ace. And you can let this go cold and pan-fry it as well if you wanted to. It makes little pan-fried cakes, but this is nice little... It's not too spicy. It's not spicy because the the curry as well. And then we've got our I saw the chilies you put in the curry. There's only a few chilies, but... <laughs> yeah, this is... But remember, it's just got a whole chilli in, so... But it's the cream and the butter that brings it all back and brings it all down. And then we've got our shrimp that we can then put along the side. Oh, wow. Like that. Let's Dressed it, it so beautifully. It's because it's on TV, it has to be. Because it's on TV, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because it's on TV, yeah. But there we have it. Sort of my version is simple little prawn curry cooked for you with a little lentil dal. Easy as that. Right then, ladies, there we have it. Your oh. first dish. Oh my goodness. There you go. So, would you put it so all on how one would you eat this? this? How would you put that, some you on just that? Just start at one end and work your way through okay. the other. But it's just have a little taste of the dal, have a little taste of the curry, that kind of stuff. With the, with the shrimp, what you want to do is just you, you just take this and you just peel it out of the, the shells, really, with a, with a knife. Okay. But that's that one. Mmm. That was so nice. That, so that nice. is so good. And what about the dal? Have a, have a little oh, taste of the dal. dal. We'll taste it with the fork, but that's... It's the seasoning. It's the salt you've got to put in there. Mmm. That is so good. I can taste the toasted... Curry leaves. <laughs> Curry leaves. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. There you go. And there's nothing burnt in there at no, all. No, no burnt. <laughs> right, you're going to stick around for us all morning as well, but also you're going to sing at the end of the show. Yeah. Uh, we can look forward to it as well, but there we have it. Uh, right, I'll be cooking for Catherine and Lizzie at the end of the show, and they'll be cooking into another dish for Mr Paul Rankin very shortly. But join us again after the break, when the brilliant Francis Atkin will be working the magic behind this very stove. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Now, we've got a cod and cauliflower masterclass on the way, and I'll be chatting some more to country music stars War Thomas. That's coming up a little bit later on this morning. But first, I'm here with Mr Paul Rankin, and we're getting ready to enjoy a dish from a chef who was the first British woman to ever receive a Michelin star and been serving up sensational food ever since. It's Frances Aikins! <laughs> Wonder to have you back as well. Great, um, nice to be back. I love your food. What are we going to be doing? We're going to make a nice healthy cabbage cake, so a okay. bit different from So the opposite from the bacon food. sandwich that yeah, we did absolutely. earlier. Yeah, absolutely. As you so, said earlier on, yin and yang. It was yin and yang, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This so, is the cure. The cure. This is the cure. The cure. The cure. <laughs> the cure. <laughs> right, so what are we going to do with the, the cabbage then? Because you first of all started roasting these, so... That's right. Well, we're just going to take the cabbage and yeah. cut it into... Can we do the other one? Yeah, that's yeah. smashing. Cut it into four. So this is the old hispy cabbage, is it? nicely washed, I might say, because there's sometimes a bit of grit and stuff in the bottom of the cabbage. Yeah. And you want to use the hispy cabbage, which this is, because it's got less, less water than a Savoy. Yeah. So always get one of these. Bit of oil, bit of my nice healthy salt. Here. So tell us about the salt, because this is... This now, is... This, is, this is just another bit of healthiness for you. It's the sea salt that's totally uh, unfiltered, unrefined. That's why you can see it's So grey, that's isn't? why it's grey. But it produces this wonderful flavour all the time. So pop that in the oven. In the like oven. That. And we've got one that we've got on here. Yeah. 
the one we did earlier. The one we did earlier. earlier. Yeah. And then you want me to chop this up while you're going to show us. This is this is going to turn into a cake, is it? This this kind of. Well, idea? yeah, you, yeah, cake. I mean, it's a, a vegetable cake. And in the meantime, I've got a lovely bowl of herbs here. Uh, be careful what herbs you use um, because you don't want anything going brown. So we've got half. We've got chives, half of chives, parsley, bit of dill. Um, all the nice, good flavour, and they're not going to um, lose the colour. When Any, you, no when mint, no down. mint in that then? Sorry? No mint in no, that No, no, uh, you could put in a wee bit of mint in, yes, but it mints very strong. Yeah, you know? yeah, of course. So, so tell, um, me about, yeah. tell me about how it all started for you <coughs> then, because when I first came across you and you became you know, well, very famous to the York Arms. Yeah. Up in, up in Yorkshire, really. Yeah. But, but where were you before then and where, you know, where, where did you fall in love with food? Was it, was it... I've been in food since I was ten. So, what we're doing here... What we're doing here is we're getting a nice consistency in the crumb. But was and your family in restaurants and stuff no, like that? No, no, not at all. I um, worked years ago at a box free as a pot wash. Did you say you started with... with food when you were ten? Yes, I made I had a little cafe at the front of my house. You better hope the, the police aren't watching this. <laughs> <laughs> I just loved cooking. I never had a problem about what I wanted to do. Yeah. But as I say, and I've had five restaurants, so I know a little bit about restaurants. And was it was was the goal? I mean, I suppose the goal when you when you first when the Michelin goal was that that was not a goal for you, really. It was just always great food, wasn't it? No, no. I think if if one's honest, you one always wants a, a Michelin star, and I was thrilled to get one. But then you get to the stage where you know a lot about food and you want your... You go back to simplicity. And I've gone back, right back now, to the back, bottom back. line. <laughs> yes, this looks very simple. <laughs> this is very this is simple. Fresh. This isn't complex, yeah. though. Right, so, what, so just to recap, we've got cabbage on here. Yeah. You've got the bread. This is... This is Herbs in here? Yeah. And what are you making now? I'm just, I've just set on it. I'm just oh, this is the second batch. Yeah, second okay. batch. So if you put it all in one, you get clang. Right. And I think it's really important these days to be able to look at a recipe and think, cool, well, I haven't quite got all those ingredients, but I could do, I could do this, that and the other with it. Yep. So we're now just going to... You've chopped that up, and I hope you've not done it too finely. Well, hopefully not. No, so... Mm -hmm. He ruins everything. <laughs> he yes, ruins so I believe so. I was just yeah. checking. Terrible shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's got you all hypo. So this is this is the, the egg pie. Do you want some black pepper in there as well? Uh, no, I don't. Right. So we're just going to mix all that up. So together. that's a bit of. That's it. So I've just put in a bit of uh, Philly cheese, a bit of yeah. parmesan, eggs to bind it. Right. So I was watching a television program the other day where they forgot to put the eggs in and it all fell apart. So, <laughs> in, if as I say, if you don't want to use eggs, just use some vegetable puree. Okay. Um, I would really like to, as I was always taught to, put my hand in there. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll mush yeah. it up. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll, get it. That's get lovely. I don't want to get into trouble. No, I'll, I'll do it with me. I get in trouble every week, so it's fine for me. So, this. And then you want me to just... And then just pat it in there and pop it in the okay. oven. Well, yeah. Three. Looks great, doesn't spoon. it? Spoon. I like the sound of this. It's really, well, it's as I say, you can just use up some old bread. You can, mm. you can do anything with it. And cabbage is a wonderful vegetable. I mean, it's so versatile. But also roasting it, it takes on an amazing flavour, doesn't yeah, it, really? Yeah, absolutely. I love, love cabbage on the barbecue. I tell you what's also nice, is if you just want to roast your cabbage, and I've got a bit there, stick a bit of tarragon pesto over it, and that's just tarragon and olive oil. Mm. And the, the, the amalgamation of flavours... Yeah. Um, and as a rule of thumb, uh, green on green produces a fantastic um, flavour. Yeah. It's like tomato and carrot, which I've got there. Carrot is the basis of uh, my tomato ketchup that we make. And everybody always wants the recipe. Well, I'm telling you now on television, it's the carrot. And then Just this goes that. in the oven. Same it goes temperature? In, yeah, 160, 10 minutes. And so I've done it like that because at home you've got your oven on. You don't have to keep fiddling around with it. 
as long as you've got it, you know. 160? Yeah, 160, 10 that minutes one. in the oven. That's, so that's that bit? That's that bit done. Where do yeah. we go next? Right, um, well, we can go to prep the filling now, yeah. which again goes in the robo, which is watercress. Yeah. We're getting less ingredients on here, so we're getting, getting there. Yes, Imagine going then. shopping for this dish. Oh, <laughs> no! Pick it in the garden. Huh? Pick it in the garden. I, I'd have to... I'd have to... Sneak well, you talk about because I, I remember coming to... garden at night and steal it all. <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming down to the York Arms. I mean, yes. gardening is is a huge passion of yours as yes, well. Yes, really. absolutely. Yeah, the know. York Arms was. But how stimulating is go into the garden, get your kit, and do it with it. Super. You wouldn't find it very stimulating going into my garden. Well, you want to get interested in in it. It's very very lovely. That's fine. That's all right. Yep. And did you use a lot of your garden produce in the restaurant? And do yes, you all of it, it, all of it. Because well, we talked about the York Arms, you know, that's been the, the, the Michelin star fine dining sort of place. And yeah. then tell us where you are now then, well, because now this, is, this is a great concept, concept. Yeah, now we're back to basics, doing really, really good food, something maybe like your lamb, but maybe put a few horseradish lentils with it. We do this sort of stuff as a starter. This, this is on the menu in this the cafe? This is on the menu, the cabbage cake before. It was parsnip cake. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with all our So, the cafe veg. started as a, as a converted uh, caravan, didn't it? That's right, yes. And how... So, well, where did the concept of this... Where, where are you with this this, this converted well, the, we, we, caravan? We, yeah, OK. So, the caravan we've got rid of now because we got sick of it. Yeah. We've got <laughs> this beautiful, beautiful... Um, purpose-built place overlooking a lake. Yeah. Um, we thought we'd just open a cafe because, you know, we just wanted to be all things to all men. Well, that went a bit wrong, so... <laughs> <laughs> we had to... We had to... We kept the name cafe and we became really... Thank you. We became really a restaurant. So, so that's... you're back doing what you thought would strip it right back and do something simple. You've now gone back into the restaurant. No, 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 no. Yeah, well, it's, it's, you know, we do lunch and we do brunch and we do breakfast and we do a nice dinner um, once every Friday night. Right. So, so I'll, I'll well, do it. You're still cooking properly then. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's no one else But, to do yes, it. but there's just the three of us. Mm -hmm. So there's myself, uh, my... Yeah, well done. Lift that one on there. Yeah, yeah. Lift that one on there. Have to pop it on there, and I'll then we can plate it later. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Okay. That's that one. Yeah. And I'll take those two off. Yeah. There you go. Okay. It is very green, isn't it? It's lovely, well, that's isn't it? the idea, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, right. That. So where are we Do going next? Put then? We're going to stick our vegetables in here to garnish. Okay, this. it's on. So we take some nice carrots here. Yeah. I peeled and slightly blanched those. Okay. Now, do you do, do you grow those carrots and, and that beetroot? Yes. I'm so impressed. <laughs> I am. I'm so oh, impressed. Well, like I said, nice. the I need to come and learn how to do this. Well, James can grow stuff. You can grow. Yeah. I can't grow anything. <laughs> well, you could do. Parsley, could I can grow. It's like watching a gable table tennis. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. So we've got our plates over here. So we're not yeah. far off, ready to serve. So yeah. what about these little herbs over here? And these right. All these herbs. This tops. is garnish. Now, what I want to say to you is, is dress it in a bit of this. Dress a bit of this. Get a bowl. Dress a bit nicely. Oh, come on, James. Yes. Come on. And, um, Get it together. Um, yeah. But so a few of a few a bit of dill. A bit of that's not too much. Yeah. Oh, too much. Well, it's... I love cel these celery tops. Yeah, celery tops. I love celery tops. Always good. Just nick the ends off for celery. Yeah. Easy. I love lovage as well. And Another one that I grow Lovage, up. but lovage and um, what is it now? Wild garlic should be coming in, shouldn't it, March? We've yeah. got some shoots. I was hoping to bring some shoots with me, but... So this is a little bit of the citrus nice. dressing. Yeah. Have you tasted that? It's nice, really nice. I nice, tasted it. Nice, isn't it? It's really nice, delicious. Nice oh. ginger. Squish a bit more oil on if you want. There you go. There you go. Yeah, so yeah. is that citrus and ginger then? Like this one? Yeah. 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 Nice. But, uh, you know, fresh ginger. Mm. Lovely. Right, yeah. so we're ready to serve when you yes, are. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Food palette. Oh, you've got a lifter. Palette knife? Yeah, it's all right. Happy? It's fine, yeah. There you go. I will put that there for you so you can then Just plate up. Plate up. Thank you very much. So, there's the, your cake. 
Would you serve this mostly as a light main course or? A no, we used it. Um, well, at Paradise, slightly, not quite as, um, not quite as generous. Maybe we serve it as a vegetable starter. It's most popular. Yeah. So basically, the ladies that are all want to um, feel healthy, or anybody who wants to feel healthy. Well, if you had that as a starter, you could always have a bacon sandwich as a main course. Well, exactly. <laughs> we could, we could maybe, We're back we could to maybe you reuse, that, aren't reuse we? that caravan that I had, and maybe we could do bacon sandwiches from it. Yeah. Oh, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. James? Revive the caravan. <laughs> what? You always make this look pretty. Look at that. It just looks. E. I love this kind of food. A little bit of fennel we've got in here as well. Yeah. I've never seen such small fennel. It looks lovely, doesn't it? They are gorgeous. So. It looks lovely. I'm just going to put this, which I just, you've got to have this dressing, I think. I think the, the dressing with a bit of ginger and the lime is just, just pour it is over. Is it mustard in there as well, or no? No, no, no. No, no just, no, 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 yeah. No. So give us the name of this dish then. So this is a cabbage and wild herb cake with Seasonal fresh vegetables. Gorgeous. There you go. There we Francis, go. everybody. <laughs> right there, Mr. Rankin. Oh, this is right up my street. Bon appetit there. You know what? If you wanted to do a veggie version of this for St. Patrick's Day, you could just do the cream cheese and like a carrot salad sort of thing. Yeah. A warm carrot yeah, salad. Yeah, yeah, of course you then can. You got the... Why St. Patrick's Day? Because you got the green, white, and gold. Oh, see, nice. sorry, a bit oh. stupid. Yeah. Yeah, hey, you've got to be Irish. That means that means he's nicked your recipe. That's going. Oh, yeah. I see what you mean about the dressing. That one is incredible. Yeah. 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 What it's is that nice again? One. What is that again? Oh. <laughs> what is that? What is that again? It's ginger and lime. Right. But make sure you use the right lime. Yeah. A brilliant dish. Francis Aikens, everybody. Yeah. Right, there's still loads more to come from uh, my guest this morning, Ward Thomas, and we're giving you a masterclass in cauliflower and cod a little bit later, but join me again after the break when Francis, Paul and I are heading out into the garden for a masterclass of our very own from top veg garden supplier, Don Van Marsh, the best veg grower Fantastic. I know. I can't Outside, wait to later on in the show. Great. See you after Super. the break. Welcome back. Now, I'll be giving you a masterclass in cauliflower very shortly, and there's still loads more to come from my guest, Ward Thomas. But first, I'm out here in the garden with Paul and Francis with a man who was on the show a few months ago supplying veg that, for me, was the best veg and the best tasting, the best looking veg I've ever seen in my life. So to find out how he does it, we've invited him to the house. It's Don Van Marsh. Yay! Now, they're giving you a round of applause because you, I mean, ki you kindly sent this amazing array of veg. I mean, people who are watching the show will, we witnessed it because it made your website go nuts, didn't it? We've been popular. We've been popular <laughs> since that show went out. And I've got to so... apologise to your wife as well because she's out, she's out driving as well until she's, midnight. She's on deliveries today. <laughs> she's, had to get, she's had to get someone else to pick the kids up. So, 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 so the ethos, it's a shame we didn't have all this vegetable again, but the season doesn't apply because I know you, oh, you guys yeah. are keen gardeners as well what what are we going to what are we going to be planting anyway i've brought in um some seeds for you i've gone uh, i've gone for things that are fairly easy to grow and uh, but still have quite a lot of interest i've got some cabbage i've got some spinach i've got some celery and i couldn't come without bringing giant italian parsley right. oh, okay. yeah. now we're gonna we're gonna so grow sweet. this on anyway in in yeah. the summer and then we're gonna get you back to see the see the results how it's all going so, absolutely so you, you always plant in these little seedling trays that, uh, yeah um, not well not everything would be started off in a module tray some things you'd want to sow direct into the soil right. some things get root bound very quickly in a module tray but for other things if you think the plant has its own little section of compost here that it's growing in yeah. there's nothing else taking nutrients from that there's, so some vegetables are very happy in in that environment so what we do first of all is just fill up the um, fill up the modules with some of this lovely compost. Now we talked about we talked about the fact that you're organic and everything else like that. I mean, I I see it particularly when you when you're travelling around the UK and I keep keep referencing the, the the young chefs that we got in the kitchen. The difference between I remember farming when I was a young kid. Mm. My dad would go out and plough the field. There used to be seagulls all flying around. 
and picking up the bits that the turned earth, you don't really see that anymore. Such a yeah. sad... Why is that? Is that because we've killed the soil and...? In, in a nutshell, yes. Um, the seagulls are going for the worms and other small um, invertebrates in the soil. And uh, in, intensive agricultural practices are very damaging to that kind of life that you get in the soil. Um, and the trouble is the worms just aren't there anymore. And, you, know, um, you had an amazing thing that we spoke to you about earlier as well, about pesticides and the fact that you don't, you don't put pesticides on your land. Yeah. You work with nature. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Organics, is all, it's all about life. You're talking about living solutions instead of dead ones. So when we um, want to um, add fertility to the soil, instead of using uh, dead minerals, um, we use compost, which is a living process, and our soil is living and compost um, enhances that life. And when dealing with pest issues, instead of taking the approach of death, and let's say you've got aphids on your cucumber plants, instead of spraying them off, um, we introduce beneficial insects which will eat the aphids or instead of introducing them you can just encourage them through growing plants again a living solution that attracts things that eat aphids and um, it's always a, a life solution because life nature is fantastic at balancing itself out so I'm going to start off with turnips. These are Tokyo Cross turnips. Right. These are a white variety, Japanese variety as the name suggests. Turnips enjoy growing in a clump so we're going to sow Approximately three seeds per cell. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> this talk about patience. Have you seen the size of these? I was so, wondering, could you not just check Approximately a few more, three. Eh? So, we're talking but, about um, this is where having, oh. uh, and just use one row down the edge of your tray as the next row will be something different. Okay. Um, and what I like to do, I grab a pinch of them and roll my fingers together, and then you get three or so dropping out. Yeah. So, yeah, you would get used to that. You would get a feel for that, wouldn't you? If yeah. you imagine, we're, we're sowing tens of thousands of, of plants at once. Mm. And there um, isn't a machine so. that will do this. Uh, there are, and um, we're, we're, at, we're not really at the scale where we can afford it yet. So, so oh, um, really? So yeah. Yeah. Another two appearances on this show, you will be. That'll, yeah. <laughs> when so, it gets busy. <laughs> so a, a typical, a typical um, spring and summer evening for me is um, uh, put the kids to bed and then get the seed trays out and sit up till half eleven. <laughs> How relaxing. <laughs> but yeah. the rewards, I mean, the rewards, it's a shame you get, you know, the, the, the vegetables that you produce. I mean, to get stuff that only just looks amazing, but to get it to taste amazing yeah. is a different thing altogether. That, well, that, that's from the type of varieties that you're planting, I guess, as well. Oh, variety. Research. Varietal choice is important, definitely. Yeah. We've got here a spinach called Butterfly. Yeah. Um, which is a, a lovely organic spinach. It's been bred for organic situations specifically, so it's got natural resilience against pests and such. How many like. of these do you put in? So you're two? looking two to three, and they're bigger. <laughs> so even those with, um, uh, let's say... You actually don't need your glasses on for these. I can see these. Yeah. Can I ask a question here? We, we, you, you've got lines of different veg going down. Have you chosen these veg that will all sort of sprout up at the same time? Exactly you have that. to pop them on, otherwise yeah. you're going to have some ready and some not. Yeah, well, um, I'll be honest, we wouldn't normally sow a mixed tray. No, um, fine. But I did, if you do have to sow a mixed tray, you definitely want to grow ones that uh, grow things that germinate and grow at a roughly similar pace. And so will that tell you on the packet when, you, when I go along and buy a packet? <laughs> so that'll tell me. Hopefully, what to do. often it does. Right. And um, of course, you'll have an excellent gardening book to hand as well where they'll have that kind of information oh, too. Oh, will I? Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, uh, <laughs> now, if you're growing things like these shallots and bits of species, would you plant them into there or would you plant them straight into the ground? Now, they're completely different. What we've got here is onion sets. So anyone thinking of starting out and growing, you, um, you should definitely try onions grown from sets because they're the easiest thing you can possibly grow. So I highly recommend onion sets available from your local garden. Right, so we're nearly there with a few more, few more yeah, We'll do we one more so. row. Give, give us yeah. one more row. And then so we'll... this is cabbage. It's an early cabbage. Uh, this time of year, you want to be sowing spring cabbages and um, early summer producing cabbages. Now, if there's anybody as a king gardener like myself will we'll understand that you have different different places in the garden, so you never plant potatoes in the same plot year on year and that rotate, I get all that. But there's certain things in there I've tried, particularly with cauliflower. What, what, what is happening with cauliflower in Hampshire, south-facing garden, what am I doing wrong? Well, um, that's interesting. The uh, cauliflower is part of the cabbage family and they like a lot of fertility they like it moist and not too hot. So our summers can be problematic so for them. So a bit of a pain then? Yeah, and keeping them well watered during hot periods is the most important thing. 
um, giving them enough fertility, making sure they're not planted too close together. Cauliflower's like a lot of space. So I'd be asking, are they spaced out well enough? Um, have, you, have you given plenty of well-rotted compost um, for those cabbage plants, uh, cauliflower plants, and are they getting watered in oh, summer? You'll be asking yourself, I can't be bothered to do cauliflower, we'll just bin that one. <laughs> not do it again. Right, so, we, so we're nearly there with this. How do you top them all off, just to finish it all off, and tell us about right. the, the, the potatoes that you've got in there, because this is another thing that people can have a go at gardening at home, so... Well, it's, um, for, to finish these trays off, it's absolutely critical that we have our labels in there, because it, <laughs> you think you'll remember. You will not remember. No chance. And do so... they all kind of look the same, then, as they start to sprout? Uh, I forgot, I've forgotten which is the spinach one. Was the spinach one that's the second? That's, that's what... Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, cabbage and turnips will look virtually identical when they come up. Beetroot looks a bit different when it comes up. That's a separate okay. family. Um, and there's my beetroot. Have you got everything? You still want a turnip? Turnip. 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 There. Take your cross. You do this. Cabbage. Cabbage, you yeah. do this all the time. Are you ever struck with absolute awe and wonder at how the life comes from something which is rotten and and kind of dead that produces more life, and then from the dormant seed and it all. I Absolutely. mean, to me, it's incredible. Absolutely. I, every year, I spend the whole time from January through till September with sowing every single week. And you always get this feeling that this can't possibly work. Yeah. And when the seed germinates, it's a miracle every time. It doesn't it's matter like, how many times you've seen it, it's always a it's miracle. It's like a spiritual practice almost, isn't I, it? I think you you've know? hit the nail on the head yeah. there completely. He gets very sp spiritual, this yeah. gentleman at the end here. And yeah. I just find it. I think I find it fascinating. Amazing. So uh, what would we do with these? We water them? Yeah, they're going to want watering. They, at at um, this time of year, in early spring, we need them in a warm place <laughs> to get going. Um, you certainly you wouldn't want to just be leaving these trays outside, so something like the greenhouse we got here would be perfect for that. Yeah. Um, we'd water them, if possible, to put them on a little bit of heat underneath yeah. uh, to get them going, so you'd use something like a heated propagator to get them germinating nicely, and then grow them on in a sunny spot. In about um, this time of year, we're probably talking between four, five, six weeks before they're ready for planting. Not a lot. And um, you'd want to harden them off before they get planted if they're getting planted outdoors. So this is why you have greenhouses like this, because you have you plant them in here and then you harden them off in these little sort of bits in out the front. Yeah, yeah, you bring them outside to get them get them used to outdoor conditions. Yeah. And um, uh, if you were being really, really strict about it, you'd, the length of time they're outdoors would increase slightly every day. Thank you so much for coming, Dom. You're going to take these back with you and we're going to see how they progress during the summer as well. And we're just going to end... It's all in the muck. And a, a great friend of mine who runs an organic farm up the road, he said... He, I remember going to him and there's a scientist that works for him and he picked up a, a, a comp, bit of compost like that and he said, there's more living organisms in this handful of soil than there are human beings on Earth. Amazing. Fascinating subject, mm. isn't it? All starts really. with the muck. That's what it does, but there we go. Uh, right, Paul will be making an Irish stew with lamb shanks a little bit later on. I'll be serving up a second course for Ward Thomas at the end of the show. But we'll see you back after the break when I've got a mass class in cod with cauliflower. Not homemade cauliflower, but cod with cauliflower. I'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back. Now I'll be serving up a show-stopping recipe for Ward Thomas at the end of the show. But first, it's time for this week's masterclass, and I thought I'd show you a brilliant recipe using cod and cauliflower, both of which are banging season at the moment. So we've got some beautiful cod over here, but first of all, the cauliflower. Now, we've got a beautiful cauliflower over here. Now, the great thing about this, the cauliflower, is we can utilise the whole thing, the leaves and everything. So a lot of people would take this cauliflower and discard this or give it to the, the rabbits and stuff like that. But this is amazing. You can actually utilise this. So you can roast this off, including the leaves and everything else. So I'm going to do different variants of this, first of all. So I'm going to do a cauliflower soup first and then turn it into a cauliflower puree, and then we're going to do cauliflower couscous and that kind of stuff. So what you want to do with this is chop the cauliflower, then you can chop it in chunks like this. Like I said, you're not wasting any of it, all the way through like that. And then we can grab our pan, take our cauliflower, and pop it in there. Now, you want to cut it into sort of smallish, thinnish bits, florets, really, rather than sort of big chunks. And then what I'm going to do is pop some full-fat milk in it. That's going to go in. And we're going to bring that to the boil. And I'm only going to cook this for about five minutes. The thing is about soups is people think, oh, it's just a leftover vegetables. You can just throw it all in a pan and boil it to death. What you don't want to be doing with any soup is using poor-quality ingredients, but also overcooking them, because you just 
get rid of it, the flavour just goes. And overcooked cauliflower is not very pleasant, really. If you want to spice this up a little bit and you want to do different flavours, here's a selection of different spices that we're going to utilise with this, with our cod and our leaves and everything else. Ginger works really well with cauliflower. Lemon. A little bit of saffron if you wanted to. Curry works brilliantly with this, but this is quite interesting. Vanilla. Vanilla works brilliantly with cod and uh, the cauliflower. So I'm going to use this. I'm going to roast off the cod with vanilla and butter and all that kind of stuff. And we start off with a little bit of oil in here and then grab some butter, because this is where I'm going to start cooking our nice little bit of cod. So I take a little bit of butter that's going to sit in here. And then we've got this beautiful chunk of cod, which I'm going to season with a little bit of table salt. And that's going to sit in there nicely. A little bit of black pepper. I'm going to start to roast this off, so quickly wash my hands. So once we get to that stage, then we can think about our leaves that we've got in here. And we can utilise these leaves in there, because these are brilliant to cook with. So you've got all these pieces of leaves like that. Don't throw any of this away. There we go. Now, you can, and I've seen this in the supermarket now recently, these. These are tender stem cauliflower. Look, like a tender stem broccoli. They're brilliant. You can roast that off as well at the same sort of time and pan fry it. So you've got a lovely piece of fish. You can see this is now starting to colour nicely. So we then just check it. There we go. Turn it over. And I'm going to roast this off now. This is going to take a little bit of vanilla, like that. Now, obviously, it's vanilla pod. Don't go sticking vanilla essence in this doesn't work. Vanilla goes in. In we go with our leaves. Roll them around like that. In we go with that. They all go in. Nice little bit of salt and pepper. And then I'm going to roast this. It takes about sort of four minutes. Roast. That's going to go in there nicely. So all the while we've got a nice little bit of uh, cauliflower starting to bring to the boil. Now over here I've got cauliflower puree. Now it's exactly the same way as I've made it here. What you do with this is you take the cooked cauliflower out of the milk, pop it in a blender like this, a little bit of double cream, blend it for about two or three minutes, season it. I season it with table salt. You get the thing is with this puree and soup, you need to season it properly with... It needs, particularly salt is the key. And you produce this amazing cauliflower puree, which is brilliant with the roasted cauliflower, which is in the oven. So we've got our cauliflower cooking away nicely. Just turn that down a little bit. And I want to show you something else that we do with our cauliflower. So this is like a raw salad <laughs> that, you can, that you can do as well. And don't forget, you could actually serve this. If you roasted the leaves off like that, you could serve it with this sort of raw salad as well. So, like I said, keep everything like, else like that. It's brilliant. Or put it in the garden, because it's great for wildlife, is this sort of stuff as well. But you just take our nice little bit of cauliflower like this, take the florets off, and don't forget, you can roast these as well. These are delicious, just roasted, like I was doing with the cod. You can roast those off as well. But what we're going to do is we're going to make a cauliflower couscous. And it's really simple to make. You just take your blender like this and pop your cauliflower in here, like that. Now, when you're putting the lid on, what you want to do is you want to blend this, but you don't want to blend it too much, not too fine. So keep your eye on it. Now got this couscousy sort of look to it. You can take this out. Grab yourself a bowl. And you've got cauliflower couscous. This sort of look at this. This is amazing, a little salad. And then just to finish this off, and this is great raw. This is the great thing with this. Just keep my eye in my nice little soup there. And then to finish this off as a nice little salad, we can take some parsley. You can just roughly chop it. Like that. And you can pop that in there as well. Now, if you want to put a little bit of curry in there, you could do with this, and just to make a little bit of dressing. So you can take a little bit of curry powder, just a touch. You can take some maple syrup, because this is amazing with this. Good dollop of maple syrup. And then we make the dressing with... You need the acidity, so you've got a little bit of lemon and then some olive oil. And then we can then mix this together with a bowl. This creates a little dressing. Pour that 
over the top of your cauliflower. Good amount of seasoning, salt, pepper. Mix this together. This is, this is great whether you have it cold or serve it hot with something. And you just pile that on there, but look. So you've got this simple little dish. It tastes wonderful, this. But the key to it is don't overblend that cauliflower because you want it to look so like couscous, otherwise it starts to blend into sort of a puree. But that's that one. We've got our fish that's been roasting away. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, fish is perfect. So you see the roasted cauliflower, you've got these lovely sort of brown bits, is exactly what we want. And then we can just serve this. Remember, this has got the vanilla in and everything else, so I've got my puree. Like that. And you've got this simple little puree that with it. But the seasoning of this is key. Tastes really nice as well. And then you've got your lovely fish. Which you can simply take that, serve along the side. And then you've got this roasted cauliflower stalks with it as well. And in here, you've got a lovely sauce with the vanilla. Now, if you wanted to change this slightly, you can just take a touch of curry and just pop it in there. And you can pour this curry and vanilla butter pan juices over the top. You see how quick and simple that is? Really, really tasty. Really tasty with the vanilla and everything else. But there you have that dish. Done. And then one final one. We can turn our attention to our soup. So what you want to do, really, with this is you want to make sure it's cooked. So just... So once it starts to break like that, that way it's going to be nice and cooked. So you want it soft. That's the key to that. Wonderful, that's done. And then we can take our blender. And we can then pop this in the blender. So, this, if I was making cauliflower puree, which I talked about, I'd basically just do what I'm doing here. I'd take the cauliflower, the cooked cauliflower, discard the milk, and then pop it with a little bit of cream. But obviously, for our soup, we can blend it all in as well. And what you can do with this is then you can start to infuse this with a little bit more flavour, where you've got some double cream. If you want to put a little bit of curry in it, you can do. Just a cut curry. Now, this is the key to soup, is season it, particularly with salt. And that goes with most vegetable soups as well. Make sure you put plenty of seasoning in there. Really does help that. You can offset that with a little bit of lemon if you wanted to as well, but seasoning is the key to this. So make sure your blender's turned down. Blend. So then that is now blended. And, that, and we can then pour this straight in here. So you can see you've got this beautiful, rich, velvety soup. Now, I'm just sealing off a little bit of these with a nice little bit of garnish as well. The remaining bits of butter that I can do. It's going to go in there. So we've got a nice little ladle. You can enrich this with a little bit of butter if you wanted to, but it's entirely up to you what flavour you pop in. But you've got your nice cauliflower soup. Look at the colour of that. But funny enough, tastes like cauliflower. I don't mean to take the mick out of my family, but my nana, God bless her, she passed away several years. She'd be laughing at this because she used to put cauliflower on for Sunday lunch for us when she lived in Chapel Town, up a Bocca Flats, and it was two and a half hour drive from our house. And you could smell it from our house to their house. It was, uh, yeah, slightly different, but look, you got the bits of cauliflower cauliflower leaf, and then a little bit of oil, you can mess around with this, and if you want, like that. It's a little bit of green oil. A little bit of coriander, because that works with cauliflower as well. 
But there we have it. I mean, it's just <laughs> the simplicity of this is the key. But there you have three or four different dishes if you take the puree as well, all using two ingredients that are banging season right now. Cauliflower and cod. Done. Now, if there's any you'd like to learn about a little masterclass, then do get in touch. We see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when the one and only Mr Paul Rankin will be trying to top trump all the rest of us with a dish of lamb Irish stew using lamb shank as well. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Now I'm here with Francis, Lizzie and Catherine and with St Patrick's Day coming up. We're meant to be tasting the Irish stew, but who knows what's going to happen with this chef. He's probably changed his mind last <laughs> minute. Decided to cook something completely different. It's Mr Paul Rankin! Yeah! What are we going to do, Chief? Uh, what are we we're going to do a sort of lamb shank version of Irish stew. Now, okay. Irish stew is a very simple dish. Um, and it's, it's a gorgeous dish um, that I love. But this, this one is very easy and it's very satisfying. So it uses lamb shanks. Now, now when I first started training in, in London, lamb shanks were 20p? 20, oh, 20, they, they weren't expensive, p? were they? they? They were nothing, were they? And I, now, was, now... I was probably the first chef in the UK to put a lamb shank dish on the menu. Well, you're to blame for the price. Are you up? sure? <laughs> no, because I, st I stole it from... It's modi modest as well, isn't it? <laughs> No, no, honestly, you stole I, it I stole it from a great chef in California right. called Jeremiah Tower, and he had made lamb shanks one of his signature dishes. Yeah. And so I had um, sort of tasted this beautiful lamb shank, so I put them on my menu, and then... That was your fault. Well, you know, James came over, he saw it, and he thought, I've got to have a bit of that, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, right. well, I'm going to ask you to do some veg for me, James. Yeah. One of my favourite things to do with spuds is not to peel them completely, but what I say is peel stripes in them. So it's kind of a lazy man's way, but I also like the, the well, nutrition can't be bothered. from the skin. Just, I've seen him do this. Just... The nutrition from the skin is a good thing, eh? And it looks like you've put in some sort of effort. It's kind of like, oh, I've had a few too many glasses of wine. <laughs> I can only be bothered to do half the spuds. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, but it's a great idea. <laughs> That's... They'll, all be they'll all be copying <laughs> that now. And I'll have to remind you I was the first one ever to peel stripes and you spuds. <laughs> Our dad does leave the, right. the skin on his mash. Yeah. <laughs> Your dad leaves the skin on the mash. Yeah. Right. But it's much more nutritious, eh? Yeah, it's, 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 no, don't, don't, did you just turn that up? No, I turn it down, actually. Oh, OK, good. You can turn yeah. it up if you want to. No, you've done what that. What I'm going to do now You've is done that, that before me. People then... still talk to me about the time you burnt my noodle dish. I didn't burn the noodle dish. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> all right, when it's brown, like this, Carrots, do you want them cut on the bias like that? Uh, a roll cut. Do you know what a roll cut is? So, cut and then... and then the three-quarter things like this. So you get, like, wee pyramids. Have a go. So, hold on a minute. I mean, you, you, can, be bothered, you can be bothered to do that, but can't be bothered to peel the potato. No, I like my, I like my stripes in the potatoes. I like my stripes. So in goes a little bit of... Uh, light brown chicken stock or lamb stock if you have it. Chances are most people don't have a lamb stock at home, but they might have a brown chicken stock or they'll be able to buy a brown chicken stock. Yeah. Um, not too much barley. Now, classically, barley is not part of an Irish stew, but it is part of Irish broth, you know, or the good Scotch mm. broth. So I've introduced it as an Irish stew. It wouldn't be using lamb shanks. It's, it's got barley in it that wouldn't it's be in it. It's not an Irish... <laughs> and it's got chicken stock instead of lamb stock. Look, uh, this dish, I stole it's a this fancy dish. Irish Not only did I steal the dish from Jeremiah Tower in California, yeah. but I stole this dish from my first sous chef. He's a lovely fella called Eugene Callahan. Happy St Patrick's Day for next week, Eugene. Um, <laughs> it was my first sous chef, and when he opened his restaurant, he opened his wee restaurant in, in Wexford, uh, Gorey in County Wexford, this was one of his signature dishes. And I went and filmed wow. with him there. And I loved this dish, and we did it for the show, so we had to write up the recipe, and I had to test the recipes, etc. And anyway, when I tested the dish, I, I, I had some of my mates taste it, and they said, that is delicious. Why don't you cook more food like that instead of that fancy food you cook in the restaurant? <laughs> so... Because you, you ended up with Northern Ireland's first ever Michelin star, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, by accident, yeah. 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 By, what do you mean by accident? What do you mean by accident? 
Well, I didn't mean to get a Michelin star. We thought we were opening up a brasserie. So in here we got the last... That's going too fast. All right, I'll turn it down. Um, so turn it off. I'm determined. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have, next series, I'm going to have a foot pedal here for the power and just really stitch him up. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I can just see you doing In fact, that. we could do I it with, 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 with the audience. The minute you turn it up at home on the remote control, <laughs> it could be turning your stove up. We can arrange it. You could have the audience voting in as to how... We could just have Brian Turner just really messing it up for you. <laughs> the other end. Right, go on then. So we browned off the lamb shanks. We, we add the, the, the stock. A yep. sprig of parsley and a little sprig of thyme. And now that goes into a slow oven for about an hour and a half. Oh. And this is what you get after an hour and a half. Ta da! There you go. James, get that veg in there. No, you want it all in there? Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's it. So the vegetables are going to add that lovely aromatic savouriness, but also they're be going to become the vegetable part of the dish. So would you lay an layer on Irish stew, or would it all be just put into no, it? No, it's just whacked in, yeah. really, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you need to watch it if you're cooking it in a fairly deep pot, that, that you're um, maybe stirring it gently occasionally so that it cooks evenly. Right. But, uh, yeah. So the nice thing about this is it's a one-pan dish. I'll put that in. If you leave it there, I'll yeah. sort that out. So this will go in for another hour, maybe another hour and a quarter. I'm bringing this behind you. Oh, that smells so mm. good. Doesn't it? Behind you, behind mm. you. OK. So... I'll let you chop it up. Leave, 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 ah, ah. You've oh. got to wait, wait, got to wait for the money shot, because the director's a bit slow in the show. <laughs> give, him, give, him, give him five seconds to get that in, okay. and then... You've got to think to yourself, right, I think the camera's on it. Three, two, one, lift. OK, this is what you get. No. Ah! Oh. And look at that, it's just ticking over. Oh, it's just ticking over. Um, if you want to, you can... Um, we're just going to run a knife through that, roughly. You can take off the stalk, put it into a separate pan and skim it. There's a little bit of fat coming out of the lamb, but I think that adds a lot of flavour. And you're blanching your parsley just to uh, keep the green... It's a flavour um, thing. It's just a crate. It's a yeah. thing. Yeah. It changes the flavour. So it's a, it's a bit like, your, you know, your mum adding the parsley yeah. to the soup at the last yeah. minute. But if it doesn't fully... Um, if it doesn't fully boil, you don't get that lovely cooked parsley taste. Fine. That's that's good. Um, it's a kind of fresh, bright parsley taste that you one get. One food, one plate. Brian Turner's watching. Whoa! Oh. Is, is this turning into a restaurant for, well, for the... Oh it isn't, no, but we've got four plates to do. Look yeah. at this. I didn't know if we'd actually be able to get a taste. Are we getting a taste? <laughs> no, I know, I know, you can see it all happening, but I'm like, oh, are we actually going to... Yeah. So the, yeah. the other nice thing about this as a party thing is, of course, you, you can bring your, your braising dish right to the table and let, let people get stuck in. Oh. Oh, and we've got a wee ladle somewhere, James. Yeah, I've got you a ladle right next to where we are. That is going to be. I'm just going to. Just going to add, add a little the vegetables in like that. Little bit more parsley. Keeps the lovely flavours and the colour of the veg, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Now, you would, wouldn't want to be moving it too much as as uh, you know as you're cooking it. Don't play with it because certain things will will break up, perhaps, the potatoes and the leeks and onions, etc. Um, well, I like the barley in it as well. It just makes a yeah, lovely sauce yeah. with it as well, doesn't it, really? It has a little bit of thickness. It's got a lovely, lovely glaze on it. It looks yeah. beautiful. And if you want, you can garnish it up a little bit more, you know, chef -y thing with, you know, you could put a sprig of parsley or a sprig of thyme on top, that sort of thing, you know? But I don't think it needs very much at all. <laughs> don't need any of that. Don't need no. any of that. Doesn't need it. Doesn't need it. Doesn't need that, it. Alternative yeah. lamb shank Irish stew from my dear mate Eugene Callahan. Mr. Paul Rankin, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, wait. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. Is there really anything else I can get this table? Some salt and pepper. Beautiful. Look at that. It just falls. It's lovely and melting. It's very colored, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do they say fall off the bone? Is yes, it, and it does. Oh, delicious. look at that. Yeah. It's a proper plate of food, isn't it? Yeah. Yet, yeah, not only is it delicious, but it's so natural that you just know that it's... it's as, James, as James says, it's clean, proper food, you know? Mm. It's delicious and nutritious. Especially with the skin on the potatoes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the skin half on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. There we go, mate. Paul Rankin, everybody. <laughs> Uh, right, we've eaten pretty well this morning, but join us again after the break while we'll be treating these two to one more final recipe. I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> Welcome back to the last part of the show, but I'm back in the kitchen with country music duo Ward Thomas! <laughs> There we go. And uh, for my final recipe, I thought I'd do uh, something you both love. I know you love your fish. Uh, smoked haddock. I'm going to do a fish pie. Because this is one of your favourite dishes, isn't it? The ultimate comfort food. Well, I don't know, this is, this is a, a, a lovely version of a fish pie. So the first thing with fish pie, uh, we've got to talk about fish. Where do you get the predominant flavour from, really? I like to use smoked haddock for my fish pie. So natural smoked haddock. But then I poach it, first of all, in milk. So we're going to start off with some full-fat <coughs> milk. So then we take... A nice little bit of smoked haddock. This is smoked haddock. Beautiful bit of smoked haddock. It smells of smoke. Can't believe I'm whacking you I around know, the face with a bit of fish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 leaning in, don't the smell. It does oh, it smell does. very smoky. It does. Yeah, that's smoke, very, you see. It yeah. doesn't smell fishy or anything else like that, but it should have smelled of smoke. And it's, it's a bit like when, when you're doing this, you, I equate smoked haddock, you get two different varieties. You get the natural smoke one and then you get the spray one. Okay. It's equivalent to going on holiday and ha getting a tan or going to get a spray tan. OK. That's what it is. Glow in the dark, fresh orange, that's what that is. It's not... Yeah, you want this stuff. It's the real... The this real, is the real, real deal. The, the real, real holiday, this one. So I do love a spray stuff. tan, though, to be fair. You do love a spray tan? <laughs> the natural spray tan. So, how do you get a natural spray tan? <laughs> Where you look, it's a, you look. Come natural. on, nobody ever looks natural no, with a natural when spray tan. you come tan. out, you look like an orange person. But then you, when you, when you, when it, when you wash it off, it looks all natural and sunny. It doesn't look natural. No, it yes, always it looks does. like a spray tan. <laughs> Sorry, I can't believe we're having a discussion this about spray tan. I need a drink after this. Anyway, moving on, we're going to cut the mussels. In here, we've got a nice little bit of fish. But anyway, what we're going to do is t take a little bit of the wine, like that. Not too much, so I want some in my glass. Um, and then we're going to take our mussels, and we're going to cook the mussels like this, and then take out the meat. <laughs> we're going to utilise this into a little sauce. But like I said, you have been so, so busy recently as well. We, we talked earlier, and we talked all morning about bits and pieces, but we failed to mention so many other different things. Tonight! Yeah. You're on stage tonight. Yeah, at the CTC Look at them still Festival. singing, still, still speaking together. Same, like this. <laughs> yes, at the same time, but in different Exactly. Tones. So tell us about tonight, then. This is country to country? Yeah, it is. It's the biggest sort of country music weekend in the UK. Everyone that is wow. anything to do with country music all gathers um, at the O2 in London. And we'll be there. Our album came out yesterday, so it's very much perfect timing for us to be... Um, around all the country music lovers and doing... Is that country singing. music from, from the UK or is that bringing musicians from America or is that what... It... Yeah, well, so it's... Both. Yeah, yeah, I think it's both because it's like country to country and they have a lot of uh, big Nashville artists come over and sing in the main arena and then right. a lot of the UK-based artists... Um, there's so much going on and, like, just at the O2... Um, so is it, a day, is it a day thing, or a weekend thing, whole or weekend. A whole weekend? So it's not just a, it's not like a, a gig where you go to in the evening. It's the yeah. whole it's a whole well, you event. You can buy tickets, I think, for the whole weekend where you see the main the main act on the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You. Um, we're not the we're not <laughs> the main <laughs> yes, act, but right. we will be um, we'll be there yeah. all weekend anyway. And there's lots of things going on. You don't even need a ticket. You can just show up, and there's plenty to do. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, that, that's amazing. People will go there definitely. That's on, that's on this weekend. So tell us about the new album then, because this is this is launched yesterday. Tell tell us about the album then, because this is this is something very very special for you, Dizzy. This is album number five. No, album number five. Um, we've called it Music in the Madness. It was, uh, we've also got a song on the album called. Music in the Madness, which was our first single. Um, and it follows a very similar kind of theme. Every song on the album follows a kind of theme of 
even when we're living in a crazy world, like the light and love is, shines the brightest, and that's kind of why we call it music in the madness. But you say that because you, you did you have you been starting this in lockdown a bit, species? Because yeah. I had a little little. Somebody told me whether or not it's true or not. This is what happens when you do research and you Google and bits pieces on you and stuff. That's what I did did last night. That that you got inspiration from sort of crime. Real life. Oh my crime. god! Oh, we, oh Is this yeah, right? we do yeah. like it. We do like it. Yeah. We do love it. We are we are true crime fans, <laughs> as, as most um, basic <laughs> women are. Apparently, <laughs> we're very. Uh, it's a very popular thing amongst um, us. But we. We wrote a song that's on the album called Justice and Mercy, which is kind of a story song. This is probably the most fun we had writing yeah. on this album. And it's just about, like, a really <laughs> what, horrible... What, why, why is that? Because you, you had more time to do it, or...? Well, what, what... we got into a nitty-gritty kind of bit of building a character and, and other characters around that one character in the song and trying to fit it into three minutes and... You know, every verse has to be, you know, follows a story from beginning to end, and it was just really fun to do. We wrote this with a girl called Rebecca Powell and a guy called Cheyenne Meadows and in Nashville, and it just really felt like how we began when we started. We, we used to write music like that in our first ever album, and it just felt... Yeah, really fun. Definitely. But look, we've got this is our, I'm going to show you how to build this pie up now. So that you've got the, the the smoked haddock goes back in here with the mussels and the prawns and everything else. Then we put our parsley in there as well. All right. Ah. So you mix all that and lot together. Put, oh. See that looking really nice. Sorry, I'm <laughs> making. And then what you're going to do is then take this. This, this tastes amazing, but it's particularly with the smoked oh. haddock. And then. What you do. do you know what? We get lots of guests on the show, and I remember the last time you were here, you were obsessed with looking what I'm doing, and yeah, even yeah. now, you're still still yeah, doing the same I'm thing. Mesmerised. No, I don't. You know, it's it's nice to see. Look. How much salt look. there is in fish pie? That's well, this is. Like, that's not going to go in your Sorry, mouth. No. That's going to go. <laughs> this is <so> good. <laughs> <laughs> that's... It can go in like, the fish wow, pie if you want it to. Be. What a salty dish. <laughs> <laughs> Look, oh, take... I get it now. Yeah, it's like making a little yeah, sorry. Castle. You get it now? You see where yeah, I was going? Yeah, having a ditzy moment. Yeah. <laughs> so, a bit of that, bit of that. They always have to come out now and then. Bit of that one. There you go. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our mixture and that. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine's rolling her eyes. I'm not at all. I'm not. Yeah. Pop this in here. So we take our fish pie mix and fill each one up like that. So you can mix and match Master. the fish with this. The key to this, really, is using the smoked haddock. That's what you want. So we're going to pile this all up as well. Now, we talk, obviously got to talk about... We talked about your, your album and bits and pieces and your tour. Tell us about the tour. Where, where are you going on the tour? When is it? Yes. When people, people get tickets and... People tell can us about still it. get tickets. And we're our first date's in Glasgow on 30th of March, so yeah. really soon. So this people tour, can... yeah, this tour's going to be a really fun one. Yeah. And is it, is it like, I mean, I tour as well, and I'm touring later on this year. Is it like, uh, I often think when you look at the, the diary of the tour, I think the organisers must have had a bit to drink when he's been sorting this out. Because I start my tour in Blackpool, the next yeah. day I'm in South End. Yeah. I know there's no, no geographical. What sense. is going yeah, on there? No. Are yours I mean, is luckily, the same, is yeah, it? Yeah, luckily yeah. we're in a sleeper bus, so we just wake up in the next place. No matter really? You go into one of these. See, I just yeah. I just think it's it's just to me it's like a, a pit of hell that Yeah, I mean I think it's, it's gonna be three days to get used to. Oh. Yeah, it? it's gonna be very different this time round because it's the first time either of us have gone on tour with I'm now pregnant, so I'm going to be... So you're going... going to congratulations, be by the way. You. You're getting married as well. I'm, I'm married already. You get, yeah. You're married already. Yeah, married you're already. You're pregnant. You're about to go on a bus. Yeah. I'm assuming with about 14 Lots, burly blokes, burly roadies. boys, I know. Burly boys. They're actually very clean. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, that's true, yes. <laughs> I mean, my philosophy is that I think sleeping's kind of. hard when you're heavily pregnant anyway, so I might as well sleep badly on a bus. She does have, oh, I'm not. just going to have to be strict with her to, you know, having her naps in the yeah. day. Yeah. Right. Because you're not very good at napping. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it'll be fun, I think. And it's it's exciting to be going on tour and, um, again, because we love touring. Do you know what? I'm going to have that conversation with you in six months' time and yeah, then see, we'll what see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, see, this is my first, so... play the guitar right up, you know. <laughs> it is, it's a trial, you know, okay. we'll see how it goes. I, I can't speak for myself yet because I don't know how it's going to go, but I think it will be... Um, an experience. Well, I'm glad you got the appetite, you see, because the, the last pregnant person I ever spoke to was for an interview, and they were eating a belt. Oh, that's peculiar. 
That's... Be curious. Yeah. <laughs> they were eight months pregnant and they'd eaten eight leather belts. Oh, I mean, and swallowed them. And yes. Oh, I mean... I don't know whether they let the buckle. Yeah, but... I was going to say, it's quite... <laughs> Pregnancy can bring out peculiar things in people. You never know. We're then going to take more salt. This is not in the dish. <laughs> and we just pile this up like that, just, just to stop it from moving around. Now, sometimes I use seaweed in the restaurant, so you can just put the seaweed, seaweed on. But I've yeah. even seen people munching on seaweed, and it's a bit weird. You don't want to be doing that. You've got to go yeah. and politely tell the customers not to start not chewing to on it. You know. <laughs> it's not going to kill <laughs> them, but you just look a bit daft. Next, you'll, see, you'll find the munching way. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, salt. Like, <laughs> like half a hedge stuck out the, on the mouth. But look, but then we take our nice bit of... That was so quick. Scholar. How good that looks. We've got the perfect little brown circles on each little circle. Well, you see... Well, this we... looks like a pudding. You'd never know that it was fish... No, I'm joking. <laughs> it doesn't look like it. I was thinking of... You know, I was thinking... Take this away from you. <laughs> 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 Sorry, <Karen>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was thinking of, you know... Um... Yeah, I know what you're thinking. In fact, I don't know what you're thinking, to be honest with you. <laughs> you were thinking of piped... Um... Like cupcakes. Yeah, what was, she, no, what was yeah, your sister pipe. thinking? I think she was thinking like the mashed potato could have looked like um, a creme brulee. Or yes, something. exactly. She, she I mean, I don't agree, no, but, but no, I can no, understand. Like, like, yeah, I've got no idea what they're on about. It's no the idea. brown top. It's yeah, the, like, it, it looks. I know like, what a creme brulee looks like, and it yeah. doesn't look like that. The brown top. It's like caramelised kind it of thing. It doesn't look like that creme brulee. <laughs> if it looks like that, it's gone wrong. Yes. All right. Anyway, there we have it. My version of a fish pie, or in Petersfield. Where these lot come from, <laughs> looks like a creme brulee. <laughs>